My name is Jayla Sand. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jayla Sanchez Warren. I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, also known as Dr. Cog. For those of you who don't know, not a doctor, <laughs> just uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, I'm so grateful that you're here today. This is, first, let me tell you about the Area Agency on Aging. We are uh, a, a network or a, a part of a network of area agencies on aging. There's over 600 in the country. Um, and there are 16 in the state of Colorado. We're the largest in the state of Colorado. We cover Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, Gilpin, Clear Creek, and Broomfield counties. Um, we, the goal of area agencies on aging is to provide community-based services to help people live independently as possible and to age better. Uh, so we uh, get our authority under the Older Americans Act and the Older Coloradoans Act. And basically they give us at the federal level, a bunch of regulations, pages and pages and pages of regulations and money that goes along with it. And they tell us what to do. They say, you need to fund services like transportation and nutrition and in-home services and legal services. There's a whole list of um, uh, services that we have to provide as an area agency on aging. Then the state gets it and they say, oh yeah, and we want you to do this and this and this as well. So they add on more regulations and they do our policy and procedure manual um, and they, are, they monitor us. So uh, they audit us and hold us accountable for, for uh, those state and federal dollars that we spend. In the area agent, in our area agency on aging, we have 13 internal programs, things like information and assistance, case management. We have a refugee program. We have a SHIP, um, which is a, a, um, a Medicare counseling and benefits uh, program. Uh, we have uh, the long-term care ombudsman program, which protects the rights of people that live in nursing homes, assisted living. Um, and we have the PACE long-term care ombudsman program where the only PACE program in the country, ombudsman program in the state, sorry. Um, and then we contract with 33 right now, community-based organizations to help us meet uh, the requirements of the Older Americans Act. So we fund, for example, eight different transportation companies in the metropolitan area to provide transportation for older adults. We have three different nutrition programs that we fund to provide nutrition services and meals for older adults. So that's kind of how we work. Um, and one of the requirements, so we have to fund services, provide services. We're the regional planting, planning entity and every four years, we have to do an area plan on aging. And one of the key components of the area plan on aging is the um, customer or consumer input. So we do lots of things to get input from older adults. One of them is the COSOA, the Community Assessment Survey of Older Adults. We call it COSOA. It's a survey that we did of a lot of folks. We also did um, community conversations and key informant sessions. I'm going to go over the results of the COSOA with you. And um, we will talk about it. A lot of statistics. So I'm going to try and keep that entertaining um, because it can be kind of dry. Uh, just giving you information about what we found out. Uh, and while I do, while I load the program, Kelly, you, why don't you go through and um, have people do introductions? Great. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to see that there are quite a few of you who haven't been on this series of webinars, which we started last month. And we have another webinar in April. So we'd like to go through really quickly I'll uh, say your name and ask you to just say something like one or two sentences max about yourself and, and your relationship to aging issues. And also, if you're new to this webinar series, please put your name and uh, email 
in the chat so that we can be sure to send you information. Uh, well, we'll be sending Jayla's PowerPoint out from this event, and then I'll be able to uh, notify you of the meeting that we'll be holding in April. So I'm just going to go through the list that I'm seeing on my uh, screen. Gretchen Lopez. Yes, good morning. Uh, Gretchen Lopez, chair of the Seniors Council of Douglas County. We are the voice or the COA of uh, Douglas County. We have over 65,000 older adults right here in uh, Dugco. So I'm happy to be here this morning. Thanks, Gretchen. Rich Morrow. Good morning. Um, my name is Rich Morrow, and I'm the uh, Director of Legislative Affairs for Dr. Cog. And I'm always happy to support the AAA whenever I can. Shirley Prop. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Shirley Purby with Audio Information Network of Colorado. We provide access to news and other content in an audio format for anyone with any barrier to reading. So that's, you know, local news um, and then also health and wellness things for older adults to keep them engaged. Great, thanks. Um, Tom, Tom, please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Mahowal, Mahowald? Are you there, Tom? Tom from Netherland. It's a board uh, member of Dr. Cog. Yes. <laughs> Um, next on my list, I'm seeing Allison Jukowski. From Sunrise. And then we have another Allison, Allison Cutting. I'm with Douglas County um, and I do senior adult services and transportation services. Great, thanks, welcome. Bernie. Hi, I'm Bernie Schmeitz with the Colorado Gerontological Society and I do the vision in hearing, um, sorry, I didn't get my video to work, <laughs> uh, do, the, do the vision and hearing um, programs for seniors or people over the age of 60. Great, thanks Bernie. Thanks. And now I'm seeing a, a, a name spelled B-R-O-S-A. That's me, um, Ann Brothers. I am a, a senior advisory board member for the Thornton Senior or, or Thornton Active Adult Center. Great, welcome. Kathy Noon. Hello there, Kathy Noon. I represent Arapahoe County on the Dr. Cog uh, Larger Advisory Committee on Aging, and I was the former mayor of the city of Centennial and a former Dr. Cog board member, and so glad we're doing these, these programs. Thanks. Courtney Stryker. Good morning. Um, my name is Courtney Stryker. I'm the uh, division manager for Arapahoe County Senior Resources and Veteran Services, and also the current chair of the Arapahoe County Council on Aging. Debbie Watson. Good morning, uh, Debbie Watson with Primetime News. Uh, we're a free monthly publication in the greater Denver metro area, and we go as far north as Berthet and as far south as Castle Rock. Great to be here. Thanks for all you do. Donna Mullins. Let's see, Donna Mullins. I'm a longtime member of Jefferson County Council on Aging and on the Advisory Committee on Aging for Dr. Cook. Fonda Buckles. Hi guys, I'm Fonda Buckles. I'm with Dr. Cog and I'm the manager for Community Resources. Nice to see everybody. Edward Moss with Broomfield. Good morning. I'm Ed Moss. I'm with the Broomfield Senior Resources Board, former mayor of Westminster, and also a former Dr. Cog board member. Great. Jesse Romito. Hi, um, I am the program manager for the Thornton Active Adult Center. Wonderful. John Moran. 
Hello, I'm John Moran with the City and County of Broomfield, Adult Protection Caseworker. Jay Reeves. Hey, good morning. I'm Jennifer Reeves. I work with Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging, where I manage our veteran-directed care and also Medicaid transitions programs for veterans and adults with disabilities. Great. Josh Hamilton. Good morning. My name is Josh Hamilton. I work for North Metro Fire, and I do community risk reduction. Kelsey Thiessen. Hi, good morning. I'm Kelsey Thiessen, Director of Operations at Aging Resources of Douglas County. We are well represented today. Sarah Ferris. Good morning. I'm Sarah Ferris. I'm with North Metro Fire as well, and I'm their public information officer, but also oversee our risk reduction team. Okay. Sarah Schroeder. Schroeder. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Schroeder. I'm with Eaton Senior Communities and Lakewood, Colorado, we are affordable housing with uh, supportive services for low-income adults. I'm also the president of the Jefferson County Council on Aging. Great, Sherry Haidvogel. Steve Conklin. Sorry, sorry, here I am. <laughs> so I am Sherry Haidvogel. I'm the uh, Medicare Community Liaison with Kaiser Permanente. Great. Uh, Wynn Shaw. Hi. This is, I'm... This is Steve. You had actually called oh, me sorry. and yes, skipped though. So <laughs> Wynn, if I, I, can, I can skip in. Uh, Steve Conklin, I am chair of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. And I'm also a city council member in Edgewater and uh, interest in aging is I have two, well, I, I had two, I now have one surviving aging parent that I've provided a lot of care for. Great, thanks, Steve. And at this point, my list is running out. So I just would ask anyone whose name- Now win. <laughs> Oh, right. Win. <laughs> so I'm Wynne Shaw. I'm vice chair for Dr. Cog and um, mayor pro tem for the city of Lone Tree. Um, I am an aging adult myself, so I have an interest and Jayla keeps us well informed on the ACA. So thank you. Thanks, Wynne. Anybody else whose name I didn't call? Yeah, my name is uh, Debbie Sprinkle. And I'm with the Thornton um, Active Adult Board. Okay. Thornton is a very active board. <coughs> There's quite a few of you here today. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, Tom Mahold up in Netherlands. Um, hi, Tom. Hi, also uh, Dr. Cog, director and uh, Mayor Pro Tem up here. Um, I'm also an aging adult taking care of three others right now, uh, my wife's folks and my mother. Um, that takes a, a lot of back and forth. I'm uh, acutely aware that I'm on the on deck circle. Hi, I'm Lauren Bell. I'm the program manager with Dr. Cog's Community Options Program, which assists people that are living in nursing facilities that would like to learn about their options to move to the community. Great. And again, if, if this is your first webinar, um, please put your uh, email in the chat so that we can be sure to let you know about the next webinar in April. I think that's it, Jayla. We have a great day right. here today. I am so, so excited um, that you all are here. Thank you so much for being part of this. I'm really um, excited because I need you all to be um, kind of Carriers of the message, right? Uh, letting people know, first of all, the aging, the older population, for those who didn't see the first webinar, um, it, that was all about the demographics. Our older population is the fastest segment of our population, the fastest growing segment of our population. Between now, um, 2020 and 2050, uh, we, were, we will see a 99% increase in the older population um, and only a 2% increase in those 17 and under. For the first time ever in history, ever in history, um, in the state of Colorado, we have more older adults this year than we will have people under 18. That's never happened before. 
we're not really ready for that. Um, we're still building family housing. We shouldn't be building family housing. We should be building housing for two people and one people, one person. <laughs> we should start thinking about the infrastructure that we need to support an aging um, community. I would like to share the results of our community assessment survey of older adults um, and give you some kind of insight into what older adults are facing now, which hopefully will help us understand what the needs will be in the next four years, um, as well as um, the next uh, 25 years. So let me uh, start out with a little bit of background about the COSOA. Um, the survey was conducted by the National Research Center at Polko. This is an organization out of Boulder. We um, surveyed, we got results from, from 4,597 older adults. We had a hard time getting people to respond this time around, um, but we will take whatever we can get. We know that COVID impacted um, some people's willingness to share information as, as well as the fear of um, being scammed or, um, you know, we tell people all the time, don't give information out about yourself um, because it may be used uh, inappropriately. And I think that that hurt us um, this time around for this survey. The margin of error though was plus or minus uh, 1.45. It is, it is a statistically um, valid survey. It was weighted to reflect the, the proper demographic composition of older adults. Um, you can get all this information in the survey uh, results yourself and learn all about it if you're this kind of data person that wants to know. We will, when we send this information, we'll send you the PowerPoint as well as the links. So we did a COSOA survey for the region, which included all those counties, Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, Gilpin, Clear Creek, and Broomfield. And then we did county reports, right? Um, so you have, there's one for each county and then did three cities. We did Golden, Commerce City, and Aurora. And those are also on the website. So anyone will be able to access this information. I am working on PowerPoints for each county as we speak so that I will be able to go out and give the county version of, of uh, COSOA presentations to folks who are interested in. This is the fourth time we've done COSOA in the region. And that gives us a little idea of where we may be um, seeing improvements and where we still need to do some work and where we've seen um, an increase in need over time. Uh, current results in the survey are presented along with prior results when they're available. So when you get the full survey, you can see it over time and how we've how, how things have changed. Um, previous findings from COSOA are available on the, uh, on the Dr. Cog website. So we have the older COSOA reports as well, if you're interested in that. The, um, uh, the goal of this is to identify community strengths, articulate the specific needs of older adults in the community, estimate contributions made by older adults. Really important to do that. And I'll talk about that in the slide um, because it's important to understand the value that older adults bring to our community. Um, and then develop estimates and projections of resident need in the future. This was a random sample of older adult households. It was a multi-contact method and it's statistically weighted to reflect older uh, adult populations. We use this in a, in a number of ways, the results of the COSOA first, kind of on the immediate goals, what we're gonna do. So I'm looking at this um, and I'm using it in our planning for the next four years, but I'm also looking at it on figuring out how to allocate resources. Um, so we get a certain pot of money from the federal government, from the state government, and we put out an RFP and we try and use the information to help us make good decisions about what services we should fund. There's never enough money to fund all the requests that we get. So we have to um, 
this this survey helps us make decisions. Advocacy. Uh, this is this information is really important. I'm so glad that so many people from county councils and city councils and uh, from Adams uh, Active Adults uh, uh, Center is are here because these numbers can help you advocate for needs in your area. Um, and then engagement. How do we tell people this information? Uh, it's so important that we just don't hold on to this ourselves, but that we share this information and let the powers that be and others know what's going on in our communities. A lot of people don't think about older adults and the needs of older adults. Uh, this is really important information. Intermediate goals. Uh, we we need to look at are there are the right programs out there to meet community needs and changing needs. How do we improve the programs that we already have out there? Are they working the way they should? Should we tweak them just slightly to make them more effective? And then in policies, um, Rich is on, you know, we're constantly looking at bills and, and, and how we could shape policy to improve things for older adults. We use COSOA results in that as well. And then the long-term goals. We want to support um, communities that are that are trying to make their community better place for older adults. Um, and that means older adults that are healthy, engaged, empowered, independent, productive, and vibrant. That's our long-term goal. We want people to age as well as they can. And there are so many components of that, right? There's personal components. There's um, uh, programs that help people do that. Um, but there's also institutional and then there's um, infrastructure that needs to be done in, in order to make our communities a place where older adults can thrive. We have to be thoughtful about it. And sometimes it takes a while to get there. So we have to know what the needs are so we can start moving in that direction to help resolve those needs um, as they grow in the future. There's going to be more older adults than any other population. We have to start thinking about how do we meet those needs for people. So this survey tells us what we're doing best in our communities for older adults and what some of our biggest challenges are. I should tell you um, also that the state of Colorado, so every area agency on aging, 16 of us, did a COSOA. So there's a statewide report as well that the state unit on aging has. Um, and um, there are reports for each uh, uh, AAA uh, on the um, AAA website, which we can send a link to as well. We know that COVID um, impacted every aspect of community living. We know that older adults were hit hardest by the virus um, and, and have, were impacted greatly and still are impacted by COVID. Um, we think that a lot of these survey results were also impacted by COVID. We don't really, some of the results seem very different from the three times that we did it before. Um, and the way uh, the National Research Center described this is they think that it was a, a, an impact of COVID. So it's hard to kind of flush out, but we'll see how much progress we've made in the, in the next time we do it. Um, and what we'll get a better understanding of the impact COVID had on the answers that people gave to these um, questions. This survey looks at community livability. There are six domains of community livability that are explored in this survey. Community design, employment and finance, equity and inclusivity, health and wellness, information and assistance, and productive activities. I am only gonna give you a summary of this report. Uh, it will be available. If you really wanna dig down into results, for the region or for your county, uh, it's, it's available for you. You can look at all the 
uh, the data, the questions, how the questions were designed. Uh, um, so please do that if you're interested. News is that most older adults were pretty happy with the place that they, they said that they reported their community was a good place to live, 83%. Um, they also said they rated their neighborhood as either excellent or good. 78% reported overall quality of life was positive. So that's really um, pretty good. 76% uh, said that they plan to stay in their community throughout retirement. This is really important to understand. There is this myth that people in Colorado move out um, and retire elsewhere. They don't. We keep our older adults here in the state of Colorado. We have people that are snowbirds and they, they go somewhere for the winter, but they come back and this is their primary place of residence. We have a lot of in-migration. Um, well, not a lot, but we do have in-migration from places like Minnesota and Iowa and Michigan. We don't have a lot of out-migration. We see more out-migration in the last two years primarily from the cost of living. Um, and during COVID, people, older adults moved with family members uh, to other places. But typically that is not something that happens in the state of Colorado. We keep our older adults. So what does this mean for those of you that are elected officials or in planning positions? Um, that means we have to plan for those people who are going to stay here. What are their needs going to be? How are we going to make them contributing members of our community? How are we going to support them in the way they need to be supported? Um, and it's, yes, there's personal responsibility and family responsibility, but there's also a larger community responsibility. Um, 70 said that they would recommend living uh, to someone else to live in their community. 64% uh, that said that they're community was a good place to retire. So now you start to see the numbers getting a little bit lower. And if you're like me, you say, why is that? What's going on? What's, what are those, what's making it a little bit harder to retire in the community? So the highest response, so 70% of the people that responded um, said, these were that the ease of that they had either good or excellent ease of travel by car, which is good. Ease of getting to places that you usually have to visit. That's good. That's this is a change from last the last time we did this survey. Um, opportunities to attend religious or spiritual activities, uh, fitness opportunities. People said were good or excellent. And then the ease of walking in your community. I think this is really important. Dr. Cog, as a larger organization, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, has been really working on, along with all of our communities, um, improving mobility um, by car as well as by walking and, and, and um, bicycle. And uh, we've seen more communities really try and work on circulars in their, you know, transportation circulars to take people around their communities. So this is positive news. 60 to 69% of the respondents said that ease of bicycling was good. I would like to see more tricycles. I would like to see um, electric vehicles offered on the pathways. Um, uh, a lot of pathways don't allow uh, electric vehicles on their pathways. I think that's another area that we could improve to make uh, it easier for, for people to um, bike. Recreational activities. Uh, this is an, an area that Im improved from the last time, four years ago when we did this, opportunities to um, volunteer. Availability of preventative health services, such as health screenings, flu shots, and educational workshops. We think that this number, this statistic was influenced highly by COVID um, and all of the vaccination sites and the test sites that were available. We have not seen scores this high ever 
And so it'll be interesting to see if people report this in the next, in the next four years. percent of older adults identified the following as challenges. This should not be a surprise to people. The availability of accessible housing, right? This is that housing with no step entries, with a single floor living, wide hallways and doorways, places where we can age into. Um, a lot of our housing stock was built in the 70s. And I always say that housing built in the 70s is not great for people in their 70s. Um, we weren't thinking about how people would age in their homes. And that's, that's a problem for a lot of people. The cost of living in our community. We have seen the cost of living in the Denver metropolitan area, actually in the state of Colorado, skyrocket. It is getting harder and harder for people to keep up. Um, you know, we hear people all the time say when they were retired, their income was just fine. Now it's 20 years later, they're not able to keep up with the cost of living. Availability of affordable quality housing. Many people say to me, I would love to move out of my 3000 square foot home. I'm all by myself, but I can't afford the smaller 1200 foot version. I can't afford it. Even if I sell my house between the, um, the taxes I'll have to pay, I just, I, I can't, I don't feel like I can do it. We don't have good affordable quality housing in the region. And especially that's designed for older adults, right? Those three story um, townhomes aren't really a great um, fit for older adults. Something that we need to think about and need to start really thinking about what's what is the housing stock that we're going to need to have? Um, in, we need it now. I mean, one of our biggest challenges in our office is people are, are their rents went up $300, $400. They can't afford to live there and there's no available housing. So if it's a problem now, think about what it's going to be like 10 years from now um, when we have a bigger, older population. percent of older adults, uh, older adults identify the following as challenges. Knowing what services are available to older adults in community. I have to be honest with you, this has always been an issue for my entire career. I've been doing this for um, 35 years, working in the field of aging for 35 years. This has always been a problem. It is slightly changed though. In the past, I would hear people say, I have no idea where to go to get information. Now I hear, I get online and there's too much information. I have no idea how to sort it out. I don't know what's a credible place to go. What's a place, you know, I don't want to get scammed. I don't want people to take advantage of me. I, there's too much information. I go on the website, I get lost. It takes me somewhere else. I get frustrated. I give up. So now there seems to be like, a whole lot of information out there, but people still don't know how to access it to get what they want. So it's a slightly different problem than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Another problem that we heard a lot about in community conversations, as well as in the survey, is doing heavy or intense housework, right? Um, just really being able to do those deep cleanings to clean behind the toilet, to get on the floor, to clean out the, one lady told me, I need to clean out my dryer. I can tell there's a lot of lint in there, but I can't get it out. Um, that's not necessarily intense housework, but it's just neat stuff that needs to be done that she's not able to do. Um, you know, uh, this is the generation that washes their windows uh, a lot. And, and there was several people that talked to me about, I'm not able to get my windows washed. And do you know how much it costs to have somebody come out and wash your windows? Um, and so that was the other factor is the cost of doing or hiring, excuse me, <coughs> um, those, those uh, people to do those, those heavy tasks. Maintaining their home. 
we heard people say, my home is older than I am and I am falling apart and my house is falling apart. We literally heard of people talking about holes in their roof, faulty electric um, wiring, faulty plumbing, um, and then the cost of, of, of fixing it. Uh, you know, that the house has really, really gone down. And now it, I, it's not just one thing that needs to be repaired, but it's three things that need to re be repaired. And they're all $5,000 or more, which isn't doable um, for a lot of older adults. This is a big problem. I haven't, I have been doing these um, community conversations and doing, um, being a part of COSOA for over 20 years. I have always heard maintaining a home as a problem, never at this level. This is a big deal um, and it's getting bigger. Having adequate information about dealing with public programs such as Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, veterans benefits, um, all of the Medicare Advantage programs, all of those things. You know, there are over 30 different Medicare products available in the state of Colorado. It is hard to navigate those things. Um, I wanna remind you that the area agency, every area agency on aging has a SHIP program that helps people understand each of those programs or, or there is a SHIP program in every community um, to help you understand the details of those different um, programs then how they work with Medicaid and how they work with veterans benefits. And here in, um, in the metropolitan area, Rocky Flats insurance, all of those things come together, right? And it's important to understand them, to know what, you're, uh, what you can qualify for, what could be paid for. Um, that's getting more important than ever. 50% of older adults said they had problems with physical health, with yard work. Heard a lot about this yard work. You know, most communities have beautification codes. So if you don't keep your grass mowed or your weeds down, you can be cited by um, the, the city. Um, you be warned first generally. Um, there are several communities that go up to five times that you get so the first is a $50 fine, and then it goes up from there. Some communities will send a final letter that say they're going to put a lien on your home. That's really intimidating for older adults and scary. Um, I would encourage any community that is struggling with that, that they please work with their area agency on aging or their local aging communities to help um, we can, we can work together to get those uh, lawns mowed and the, the weeds trimmed and not stress out our older adults. I've talked with people who were literally, their blood pressure was up, they were physically sick because they were so worried about losing their homes well into their 80s, some in their 90s. They just couldn't keep up with their yard work anymore. Staying physically fit is a challenge that people talked about for a variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, having problems, my knee went out, my shoulder went out, I have to, I, you know, I'm having heart trouble. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's something that we have always heard in the survey. Feeling like your voice is heard in the community. People feel like older adults aren't listened to. They get, they, one lady told me, I became invisible and I don't know when it happened, but people don't see me and they don't hear me anymore. And I think that is incredibly sad. And I hear it often um, and I wanna change that. I wanna give you all the tools and the information you need to advocate for yourselves because you are the dominant population and will be for the next 30 years. And, and your needs need to be taken into consideration. I'm just a few years from it myself. So I'm gonna be there as well. Um, I, I think it's so important that people understand that older adults have 
specific needs, but also can contribute in so many ways. Having enough money to meet daily expenses. Boy, do we hear this a lot. And you hear probably this on the news. You've probably heard it from your friends. You know, people making choices between whether they're going to pay for food or medication, expenses, everything has gone up, right? Eggs, milk, um, food costs, gas costs, everything has gone up. But the older adults, they got a little bit increase in Social Security, but their income isn't staying up with um, the costs. And so they're having to make some tough decisions, especially those on the lower income level. And they're certainly foregoing fun. So yeah, I can't really afford to go to the museum anymore, or I can't afford to go to that play. I can't afford to go even to the, you know, the library because the gas costs too much. Those types of things really impact quality of life. And so fun and the non-essentials um, go by the wayside. So let's talk about areas that scored higher in the 2022 survey um, than they did in the 2018. So more people said that their overall physical health is better. The ease of public transportation has improved. Traveling by car has improved. Ease of walking in their community has improved. The variety of housing options. So we are starting to see more housing options, which is good, right? Um, I hope we stay on that trend. The availability of long-term care options. Um, we have a ton of, there are over 500 nursing homes and assisted living in the region, in, in, in the Dr. Cog region. We also see uh, senior independent living, right? We're seeing more communities where you own the house, but the property is owned by, and they maintain the property. My mom lives in a community like that where they, they manage the house on the outside of the house and the yard. Um, so we are seeing more of those options. What we're not, as, not, what we're not seeing is affordable options like that. Um, the affordability of quality physical care. Yay. The affordability of quality mental health care. This is really good. This was a low score for us um, in the past eight years. So this is good news. And then preventive health services, those things like health screenings, flu shots, educational workshops. Nine, um, the, the health fairs are coming back. They're not called Nine News Health Fairs anymore. I can't remember what the name is but they're coming back and that's really good. Uh, those kinds of options are improving people's quality of life and health. Lower, um, the scores that are lower than they were in 2018, uh, employment opportunities for older adults. We think this was impacted largely by the pandemic as well. Um, uh, older adults were some of the first people to leave the workforce because of their higher risk to um, COVID. Uh, and uh, employers laid them off first because they didn't want to deal with liability issues um, either. So I'm hoping this will come up. We were hoping that the 22, 23, and 24 would be kind of a rebound as we saw people not come back to the workforce. We thought it would provide um, more opportunities for older adults that wanted to go back into the workforce. We're not seeing that um, like we thought we would. We have seen some of it, but not as much as, as, as we thought we would. The availability of information about resources, we talked about this, just knowing where to go, if they're trustworthy, um, how to access the appropriate information, that still seems to be a big issue. Recreational opportunities were scored lower, um, even though we saw, I think that the questioning was just a little bit different. Earlier in the presentation, I said that this was an area that was improved. Um, and now 
it's showing a lower score. I think this is a different question, but I'll have to verify that. Um, fitness opportunities, uh, including exercise classes, paths and trails. Um, feeling like there are a lot of those, I heard this in community conversations, there are opportunities, they're not really designed for older adults though. Um, opportunities to pay, uh, participate in community matters, opportunities to volunteer, opportunities to attend social events or activities. The COSOA looks at 42 specific problems faced by older members of our community. Um, and they congregate them into 15 larger categories of need. All of that information is in the larger report. This is just a summary. Again, you are, have already talked a, a lot about this, not knowing what services are available, doing heavy housework, maintaining your home, um, having adequate information. So like many surveys, they ask the same kinds of questions in different ways so that they can really hone in on those um, problem areas and those areas that we're doing well at. Uh, this again, uh, not having enough money to uh, meet daily needs. This is uh, kind of the same information. So this is the self-reported challenges. Challenges that have increased since 2018, having enough money to pay property taxes. We heard about this, property taxes have gone up significantly over the last, um, the, over the last five years. They're going up really a lot this year. And so I think this is gonna be a big, big problem for folks. I think we're gonna hear this a lot coming up because uh, the property taxes are, are really increasing. Um, having housing to suit needs. So, right, what is that? That's that accessible housing. That's that one-step entry. Um, maintaining their home, maintaining the yard. Building skills for unpaid work. Um, people want to volunteer. They want to contribute, but they don't feel like they have the skills to do it. So in, um, I heard one person say, you know, 10 years ago, I could volunteer my time to help people file and answer the phones. Now they have computers and I don't know computers that well. And I, you know, they have systems that answer the phones, so they don't really need me to do that. Um, even in childcare, there's requirements now that people have to meet in order to, um, to volunteer or to, to, to uh, donate their time. Being a victim or fraud, uh, a fraud or a scam, this is a big issue. Man, there was a ton of fraud and scam during the pandemic, a lot. And people got hyper aware. They were at home, they were vulnerable, they were lonely, and some, a lot of people were taken advantage of during that time. There are disparities. Um, people who tend, who are, they're, they're tend to be greater if they're low income, if they're renters, if they're living alone, or if they're older adults of color. We saw this over and over and over again. If you are low income, if you rent, I really feel like renters have a big disadvantage right now and are so vulnerable uh, to the whims of the market. Um, Older adults living alone, we saw a lot of problems with isolation. Um, a lot of people, uh, um, you know, we saw increased depression and anxiety during COVID, um, particularly for those people who lived alone. And then older adults of color. I think these, these populations also have um, bigger or bigger struggles during the pandemic. 
economic contribution of older adults. This is so important. Think about your communities. Who are the volunteers in your communities? Who are the volunteers in your libraries? Volunteers at the zoo? Um, who are those people that are contributing? A lot of them are older adults. And, and people take that for granted. They don't realize the value and the importance of that, not only with their labor, but with their wisdom and their education and their experience. Um, they contribute in so many ways. In addition to their paid work, older adults, I, so I talked about that, they also work in our communities, right? They're working. Um, so they contribute through, through paid jobs as well as volunteering and then caregiving informal caregiving, <laughs> there is no way if people, and many of you talked about caring for the older adults in your lives, that is so critical. We have got to support caregivers and give them the tools and information and the resources they need to be successful because the system cannot take it. If they said, nope, not gonna do it anymore, somebody else is gonna have to do it. The, I am telling you, we could not absorb the work that caregivers are doing for their loved ones, for their friends, for their family, um, for their neighbors even. Uh, you know, those people that just uh, um, remove the snow off of people's driveways and sidewalks, huge, huge service. Um, help people with their yard work, huge service. We don't have, we could not absorb that need if, if people weren't helping. The economic contribution um, that that uh, was estimated this year it went down from last year and or from the last time we did the survey in 2018, um, because largely of COVID, but still, uh, you know, significant contributions from older adults uh, to our uh, to our economy. You can see the um, you know in 2010 from 2021, um, that's a big increase. They contribute, this is important. I've actually had, this was a while ago, but people say, we don't want older adults in our communities. They just cost us money. They don't, they contribute so much to our communities um, and we need to recognize that and support them. So moving forward, there was a, there's, this is like I said, just a summary. You get an idea of some of the biggest issues, some areas that we've made progress in, but now what do we do with this, right? Um, we need to educate people about this information. We need to share this information. I would encourage you to get your COSOA report for your county and share it, look at it, go over it especially those of you that are in county councils and city councils uh, on aging. Really take a look at that. What does that mean? Is there an area? Don't try and tackle all of the problems at once. The, probably the biggest problem I see is that commissions, um, councils, they'll get together and they're like, okay, we're going to have a subcommittee on transportation. We're going to have a subcommittee on housing. We're going to have a subcommittee on something else. And they come up with a lot of plans, but they're not able to implement those plans. Plans are great, but the true genius is actually implementing those plans. It's so important to engage older adults in that conversation. It's really great for us to think, oh, we're gonna do this and this and this and this for older adults. But if we don't talk to older adults about, is that gonna work for them? or not, and, and maybe it's older adults not like you. Is it gonna work for someone who's low income? Is it gonna work for someone who is taking care of their grandparent or their grandchildren? Not everybody's the same. And so when you're looking for big changes, it's important to engage those people who are going to be using those services. Oftentimes, some of the older adults that are making decisions are pretty well off. They don't have to use the services they're trying to implement. Use the services and understand if they're gonna work and talk to the people who are using them. Earmark, so is there something you can say we are going to do? 
we want to tackle yard work in our community. We know that this part of our community has is really old and there, there are several houses that need some repair and some yard work done. Can we organize a group, get a small amount of money and be successful with 10 homes in an area? Make your goals small and achievable and then build on those goals. When powers that be see that you were successful and got things done, maybe then they'll be more apt to give funding for larger efforts. But it's really hard if you have all of these goals and deal with lots of different things to get them implemented because you always need funding for them. I'm going to tell you funding is going to be difficult in the next couple of years. All of the, the COVID relief money has to be spent by October of 2024. That significantly reduces the money available to do things like this. Our budget's gonna be cut significantly by $13 million um, because of, of not having that funding. Doesn't mean the need's gonna go away, but it does mean that we're not gonna be able to help as many people. Those people are likely to turn back to their communities and say, we need help with this. How are you communicating with your, those people that go out and do the, the fines um, uh, for not getting your weeds down? Is there a way you can work together with volunteer groups? Take action, try and get something to actually happen. Um, so you do all this planning and then try and get it implemented, but you gotta think smaller and then build, and then evaluate your results. How successful were you? Is this working? Don't wait till the end. Evaluate it all the way around. Is this working? Is it not working? What do we need to change to make it more successful? Who do we need to bring in? Who needs to hear this information? All of those are so important. I wanna tell you that we all have to work together. Um, the Area Agency on Aging plays a big role, but we, we aren't the only people involved in this space. We had people from adult protection. We had people from fire, um, you know, uh, um, so, so many fire stations, in, um, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up and that's their number one call. But that's the only, you know, they go in there and they see this older adult that's fallen and then they help them up or they take them off to the hospital, but they noticed the house is in disrepair. They didn't have any food, um, you know, all of these issues going on that they can't address. We need to work more collaboratively together to resolve some of these issues. There's not gonna be as much money as there was in um, over COVID. We all got used to that money. That was wonderful. We were able to serve so many more people. So many more people found our services. That money's gonna go away. The need's not gonna go away. So how do we meet those needs? We've gotta do it together. We've gotta work collaboratively together. I hope this information gives you some, uh, I hope it gets you thinking. I hope it gives you a tool to be a good advocate, advocate, whether it's in your county council or to get more money for something in your organization to help you know. I want you to know that the Area Agency on Aging, every Area Agency on Aging um, is a resource for people. Um, we want to be a part of the solution. We, can, we don't have all the answers, but we can help work to, with you on, on issues. I don't know where we are in time. Do I have time for some questions? Yes, yes. Plenty. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see you all. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is Ed Moss from Broomfield. Uh, you talked about first floor master bedrooms and single step entryways into homes. Does Dr. Cog, if I don't know whether Broomfield does or does not have that, I know Westminster has 
some benefit for developers coming in that include a certain percentage of first floor master bedrooms. Does Dr. Cog have any sample uh, code uh, provisions that can be shared with our own councils? We have a lot of information and I, I would, um, I will connect you with uh, Sheila, who's the head of our planning department. Um, uh, planning and aging work together uh, closely um, on our boomer bond project. So that's preparing um, communities to get ready for an aging population. We have zoning codes, we have building codes, we have lots of um, information that, that we could share. So I will make a note to make sure that um, Sheila Lynch reaches out to you um, with some information. And I, uh, there's a section on our website, which I don't have the link to right now, um, that we uh, I would send to you that has information like that. Gayla, uh -huh. that, that term is called visit, visitability. And it means that anyone who comes to your home, visits your, comes to your home to visit is able to get in there. So that's yeah. that's the, the bottom line of what that all and, means. And, and Donna, many of them have visited. Yeah, Donna, you, you all in Jefferson County did so much um, in, in Jefferson County around this. Do you have something that you might be able to share with them? Mm, I can tell you who has visitability codes. Okay. <laughs> But I'm not sure that we do in Jefferson County. What's happened, I think, in a lot of people is that developers are given incentives to implement those codes, but then they have the option to buy out. Yeah. But I know Arvada has a really good one. And I, I can Yeah, I can Arvada's check on been that. doing some really good work in this area. Um, yeah. And, and I think it's I think it's just so important. It's just, you know, it's not that people want to do, it's just people don't know that this is happening. We've never had this demographic shift in, in, in our area or in the state of Colorado. And it's happening. We had so many baby boomers move into the region in the 70s, right? And, and they stayed and they're aging and now they're aging and they still wanna live here. And so they're wanting something that makes more sense for them. And um, the builders don't seem to quite be there. Everybody wants to build assisted living like crazy. I don't know why. Population's not there yet. Um, it's not. It'll be there in 2050, but it's not there yet. And by that time, the product that's being offered is going to be 30 years old. Um, and, you know, do we want that? Shirley, you had a question. Sorry, okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you could send us the presentation. I'd love to share it with my team. Yes, absolutely. We will send the presentation. And I'd love you to take a look at the full report because it does give you so much more and it breaks it down in all sorts of different ways. I think it would be helpful to your organization to see the full report. So yeah. there'll be a link to those reports as well. Thank you. So what are your impressions? Anything surprise you? I'll just say the population boom still kind of, I mean, I know we've been talking about this for a long time, but it still kind of shocks me. And I know that it gives my young friends pause, right? When they start thinking about the ramifications of this population and how we're aging, because I'm there, right? I'm, I'm part of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, that still just makes me go, wow, what's this going to, what's going to happen, right? We're already it, it, struggling. It I, I mean, I what's think gonna it's going to happen. Right. It's, it, we're already, we already have a lot of needs now. What's it going to look like, you know, right. in, in 10 years, 20 yeah. years, 30 years from now. And, and it's one thing when people are in their sixties and it's a whole different thing when people are in their nineties, right? The needs change. And, and the thing is, we will have to be able to be flexible as that those cohorts go through those, those you know, from 60s to 70s to 80s to 90s. When I first started 35 years ago in aging, I knew maybe two or three people that were over 100. I know probably over 20 that are over 100 now. Um, oh, wow. And that's not, that's not going to be different. I mean, that's, people are going to live. I always tell my daughter, 
who's 15 right now, she can plan to live over 100. What does that mean, right? So, so it's not just that the boomers are aging. This is our new normal. We will be getting older. This is the first time we've done it. So the boomers are the first big segment of the population that's going through this. The millennials will do it too. But we've never had such a big population get to old age before. And so we don't know. It's not like we can go back and say, what we do the last time this happened? Because we've never had it happen before. And, and ever since the boomers were born, we weren't ready for them. And now they're getting older, right? But it's going to continue. It's not just the boomers. Then it's the Xers, me. And then it's and then it's the millennials, another huge population that's going to get older and older. So what do we do? How do we get our infrastructure right? How do we have enough people to care for these older adults, even in nursing homes? Guys, there are nursing homes right now that are testing care bots, robots to do care because they don't have enough, they don't have enough staff. That's how things are changing. What's it going to look like 20 years from now? And those of you on the call, you're thinking, wow, I may not be, here. you know, I probably won't be here. Some of you may be thinking that. You may be here, right? With all the medical advances that were happening. But so now you're in your 60s, then you're going to be in your 80s. What does that look like? And you might live to 100. And I have a question just for the group. I know... Five, six years ago when I was looking for a house for just myself and I was trying to be wise and get something I could age in. And it was horrible. It was hard. But I remember talking to realtors about why aren't there more condos? Like there's condos, but they're a million dollars. I mean, they're like high-end condos. There's not like condos that I can afford. And one of the things that they said back then was that there was some kind of law about lawsuits, and that's why they built apartment buildings and not condos. Do you know what that is? Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> this is a big issue for our board of directors. So, yeah, Director Shaw, do you, do you have anything you'd like to share? Sure. There, there was legislation, uh, and we lovingly refer to it as construction defects. And really, since that time, we eliminated, as the state of Colorado, the that section of housing, that that portion of the spectrum of of housing solutions. We took a big X to the condos. Um, they're very high-end townhomes and all of that. And even with the proposed legislation that will probably change the look of every single family neighborhood um, in the state, uh, if it passes and assuming it will, um, they don't seem to be willing to uh, repeal that legislation that would allow condos affordable that next step or the next step down uh, to be built. It's um, baffling to me. Well, uh, I'm a retired district court judge, Shirley, and I just put my email address in the chat box. Uh, I, it, it's a longer explanation than we have time for here, three to four minutes. I'd be happy to explain it to you um, I also used to do real estate law and, and was involved in this area. So uh, the, the legal liabilities of condos is dramatically different than apartment buildings. And, and if you're interested, send me an email and your phone number and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. I, th I think the point is, right, that, that we need to find something. We need to have lots of different housing options, right? We need to have some that are for very low income people and some for um, middle income people, but middle income, the definition of middle income has changed dramatically in the last 10 years, right? And, and, and what does it mean for people? Again, I think about the guy who said, you know, I'm 85 and um, 
my retirement was really good when I was 65 and now I'm having a hard time keeping up. I just went to the doctor's office. He said I could live another 10 years. I don't have enough money to live another 10. And, and these are people that, that, that they we worked his whole life. You know, he had, he had retirement, he had a pension, but it's just not keeping pace. And we're gonna have more and more of those situations. And so we have to think about it. Oh, it's so many things. And that's why I think it's hard when you think about this, because it's lots of different things. It's transportation, huge system. It's housing, huge system. It's healthcare, huge system. It's the cost of healthcare, right? So Medicaid and Medicare, both of those programs are gonna be trillion dollar programs very soon here for, the, for our federal government and our state government. What does that mean? That's a huge responsibility. Um, how, and so you see people, you see the government trying to put in things like Medicare Advantage and other programs to incentivize health and to um, keep people out of the hospital and lower healthcare costs. All of those things are happening because this is such a big deal. But it's also a big deal at the, at, at the local level, at the you know, housing uh, availability, but somebody to help with grass. This lady in our community conversation says, my husband passed away just a little while ago. How am I going to get our grass? I, 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 do, I don't think neighborhood boys mow grass anymore. Um, where do I start? How do I know that they're going to be legitimate? Um, I'm nervous about telling someone I'm alone um, and, and asking them to mow my lawn because that makes me more vulnerable. I mean, there's so many things, and that's why it's such a big deal. But we have to start chipping away at this little by little by little by little and working together. Um, someone was from... Uh, Adult protection. Who's who's from adult protection? Is that you, John? Yeah. Yeah. So, what are you seeing in your world around older adults? Uh, we definitely see a lack of caregiving in terms of either qualified individuals or just the availability for the hours to be providing the in-home care as well as in facility care. Uh, there's not too many options for facilities within the Broomfield area. So they often have concerns about being disconnected from family of having to move to a different county. Um, and then what I'm seeing is kind of a severe isolation due to how fragmented neighborhoods have become and a need to go more to kind of quote unquote micro communities where we have these ADA areas that have also a local grocery store with prescriptions available with staff that are a little bit more attuned to that clientele. So it is a big cultural and community shift that is needing to be changed over time. But the biggest barrier is housing. And then on top of that, caregiving and the costs associated with both. Great insight. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. The fire department folks, what are you all, North Metro Fire, what are you all seeing? Hi, this is Josh Hamilton with North Metro. We, uh, I've met John many times and his associates are at Health and Human Services, North Glen, and kind of the same things. Our crews are going out and seeing um, people not being able to find the resources that they need to utilize. It's one of the biggest challenges is just locating them. It's hard for people to navigate some of the systems and paperwork and, yeah. um, but there's a huge demand. So that's going to be part of my role is to help, uh, have crews identify those people and, uh, be a liaison between health and human services and wherever else we can do to get them services. Yeah, this is really helpful to me. You're, you're giving me some ideas too. I mean, it might be nice to have some community meetings with just like adult protection, the area agency on aging, fire, who else, whoever's responsible in those communities, right, to come together and say, what can we do? Um, there's, you know, the faith-based communities in some areas are really getting involved as well. Um, it could be good resources for things like home repair and um, uh, uh, lawn and yard work. It's always that though, a lot of the volunteers are older adults themselves too, and the liability issue, the insurance issue, all of those things are barriers. So uh, I need to tell you guys that, you know, things are gonna get harder in the next couple of years. Um, 
as as a, the 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 resources um, are, you know, we we fund like a lot of transportation and we fund in home services and we fund um, nutrition programs and we're losing funding um, and. Uh, I'm working really hard to try and get more funding, but the you know the the things I'm hearing from the Colorado legislature are tighten, tighten, tighten. Um, and what I'm hearing um, at the federal level, this is this is a positive, but it feels like it's going to take more than a couple of years to get it in place. Um, is that community-based services? More community-based services will be included in Medicare payments, so that's good. But um, I don't think it's going to happen in those in the next couple of years, uh, and so it might be a difficult time. I do encourage you all to um, contact the area agency on aging if you're dealing with someone that's older. We may not have a resource right away. We may have to put you on a waiting list, but at least they get on a waiting list, and we can start um, start focusing on on helping people. Um, Anything else? Bernie, you always have interesting things going on. Are you seeing anything new or a big change? Um, just more. Yeah. Just more of, of everything. Um, we've been dealing with a lot because I don't know if everyone's aware of the, the TABOR, the 153 that everybody can get over the age of 18. But the people who usually don't file taxes, which a lot we work with, and they're under twenty five thousand, um, they still they need to apply for their taxes in Colorado. And then if they apply, if they're sixty five or over and don't get the homestead, they can get a thousand dollars, up to a thousand dollars but they have to apply. So people over say, um, uh, well, let's start with, from the beginning. If you get, if you can apply for the PTC 104, so that means a single person under 16,925, rent or own, doesn't matter. They can apply for the PTC 104. That will include the 153 taper, and it will also include the $1,000 if they're over 65. So, and they have to have it done by April 15th. Okay. So it, for the people that aren't eligible for the PTC 104, they need to apply, just do their regular taxes. We have some forms we're sending out. Some of our people met with Department of Revenue, but they can do the DR0104, which is an in individual tax return form. But then they have to add for those 65 and over that don't get the homestead, they need to also include the DR0104CR, which is a credit. So they made it really difficult. Ugh. And, and, and Bernie, you're giving us a wonderful example. There are benefits out there, but oh my gosh, the paperwork yeah. that it takes, right? The yeah. knowledge that it takes. Exactly. Um, and, and, yeah, it, 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 it's, and so it's, I, it, it's these types of things. There are, but they're so hard to access. Um, uh, just know that Colorado uh, Gerontological Society is a resource for folks in that area. Um, again, the more we can talk and help one another figure this out, there's just going to be, there's so much more, as Bernie said, there's so many more, it feels like more people in need and, and, and more need, bigger, more things falling through the cracks than they right. it used to be. And, but then there's I, also just regular everyday folks, my parents, who both are cancer survivors. I didn't think they'd be here, to be honest with you. They're still here. Um, they had serious cancer. They're still here. They're still plugging along. I don't know how long they're going to go. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, well, do I need to keep on working? Because I don't know how I'm going to, you know, do I, am I going to need to have more fa financial ability to, to help support them? I'm not so good lord i hope i can live long enough to be a support to them because they just keep on going um it's uh 
the caregiver support, huge, huge, huge. It is so hard to be a caregiver. And I compliment you for all of you that are doing that. People are surviving illnesses a lot longer. That's a really good thing. But then there, you know, there's still consequences. My mom has limpid uh, and she's she has more things than she needed prior to her to her cancer diagnosis, but she's lived through it. So, but now we have a new body and a new new needs as a result of that. If uh, I have four parents, I'm the only child for four parents. My step parents don't have children. I, I think I'm just going to open my own assisted living and start my own transportation company because that's the only way I'm going to be able to keep up with it. <laughs> Anything else? If you found this valuable, please take a look at the, the full report. Use it. If you want a presentation or more information, um, please give me a call. This is my contact information, which you will have. Well, it just says director, but I'll, you'll have my contact information as well. Um, and thank you so much for participating. Uh, the, next, the next webinar will be about the area plan on aging. So every area agency on aging has to do a, a four-year area plan on aging. And so it's going to talk about um, what we say, which is uh, in quote, in a lot of quotes, because I don't know if we'll even have the money to sustain the existing services that we have now. Um, so we have plans if we have money, um, but uh, the biggest plan is just to sustain those core services as much as we can, transportation, nutrition, and home services, um, so that people can if um, I'd like to say thrive, but I'm not sure it's going to be hard. So Jayla, okay. if, you, if you'll send me your PowerPoint, I will get that out to tweet to folks. Great. Kelly, I'll get that to you. Okie doke. Thanks, Perfect. Matt. And I'll get the links for you too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much guys for joining. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.